now the word of God from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. Jesus was walking along, and he saw Matthew in his tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed Jesus. And as he sat at dinner in his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, may your spirit be upon us as we seek your will and your way in our lives. May this word find a place in our hearts and lives as we love one another well and conference together and receive the inspiration that only you can give. Amen. Do you have a crozier? <laughs> That's a question I had not been asked in these nine years. Uh, the questioner was Dexter Smith, who you saw bring this magnificent crozier forward. It was back in October. I said, no, I don't have a crozier. And he said, would you like me to make you one? Well, of course, I said. But I have to confess, I did not think a lot about it. People say lots of things as you're out among the people across eastern North Carolina and other places. But then the phone rang in the office. And it was his pastor, Susan Pay Greenwood. And she said, Dexter has almost finished your crozier. We want to bring it to Garner to you. I said, uh, Mike and I are coming to you. We're, we're going to be in New Bern the second Sunday in December. We'd much rather come to you and receive the gift. And so we went on the second Sunday in December in Advent. And there in the worship service received this magnificent gift, this beautiful crozier. My first thought was, this will be beautiful in the Methodist building in Garner. Look at the wonderful, wonderful carving. Uh, the symbol of the Episcopal office. Symbols also of our faith, a Bible with writing beautifully carved. Other symbols, the Alpha and the Omega, carved and painted in red and gold and in black. But then I noticed that this crozier was also very personal because on it was carved right here my pastoral record. <laughs> the churches that, where I have served and near the bottom of this magnificent piece it says, uh, given by Susan Pay Greenwood, carved by Dexter Smith. And I realized this was a personal crozier. <laughs> Look at the handle on it. Isn't the handle awesome? You've got to get a grip on this crozier, right? <laughs> and Dexter carved a beautiful place to hold the crozier, to get a grip on it. Now, he carved this crozier from a piece of wood that washed up in Maine on the beach in front of Susan and Doug's home. And it washed up on their beach the weekend of Hurricane Katrina, the last weekend in August 2005. Not many months after Mike and I had left this part of the country to go to a foreign land for, for eight years. And Susan and Doug took this piece of driftwood and put it in their garage where it stayed. And they brought it. They brought it down to North Carolina last fall. And Dexter carved it uh, with these beautiful images of strong images of chains broken and souls set free. What a magnificent crozier. I invite you to come up and look at it sometime as, as we move through this conference together. I wanted to begin our, our conferencing time together sharing with you this beautiful crozier 
which enlivens this text which we have in our midst from Matthew chapter 9. The person who made this crozier, Dexter Smith, is a person I had never met. You might say that he was on the outside of my world until I met him in Centenary Church in Newburn in the fall. And Jesus speaks and acts in this text in a way that invites all of us to a new way of watching the edges of our worlds of our friendship circles, of the people we already know, of the people in our congregations, of the people who our congregations are touching. Jesus, as he went along, looked up and saw Matthew sitting in his tax booth. And he said to Matthew, come on, follow me. And Matthew left his tax booth and followed Jesus. Now Jesus and Matthew and the disciples were lounging some text, I like that phrasing, lounging in the house around the table where they were eating and other tax collectors and sinners came in and joined them. And when the Pharisees saw Jesus and his disciples eating with these tax collectors and sinners, they said, why in the world does your teacher do this? Jesus heard the question and he said, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And then he said something very amazing, which I never caught. Having like you, I expect, been to this text many times. Jesus said, go and learn what this means. Go and learn what I'm trying to show you. Go and learn what you see. Go and learn what you watch me doing. It's going to be a process of learning, learning, living, leading, growing throughout your life with me. Go and learn what this means. And then Jesus quotes an Old Testament passage. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire compassion. I desire mercy, Jesus is saying. For I have come to call not the righteous, not the ones who have it all together, but I have come to call sinners, the ones who you have not yet embraced, the ones who have not yet heard, heeded, or loved Jesus Christ. That's my mission. Now, a little over 10 weeks ago on Easter Sunday, Pope Francis did a most amazing thing. He, of course, had the first, first Easter Mass of his papacy there at St. Peter's. And then in the afternoon of Easter Sunday, of all the things that Pope Francis might have done, he chose to go to an incarceration facility, a jail, a jail where young offenders were imprisoned. And there he washed the feet of 14 young offenders, 14, 15 years old. Twelve of these young offenders were young men. Two of them were young women was reported around the world. A pope has never washed the feet of, the, of a woman in the history of the papacy. That's a long time, y'all. This was the first. <laughs> and even more significant, one of the young women whose feet were washed by the pope was a Serbian Muslim. Now we say, why in the world did your teacher do that? Why in the world is the Pope spending Easter afternoon washing feet in a prison? Washing the feet of women? Washing the feet of somebody who doesn't even know the Lord, we might say. And Jesus says, I want you to go and learn what that means. I want you to watch and go and learn what that means. This is a magnificent journey that we're on together, and we've talked a lot about learning, about being a learning people. We name for ourselves that we are learners. We have not got it all together. We don't know the answer to every question. We might even have a, a while in which we have to converse and discuss and debate before we come to an answer to some perplexing question before this annual conference is over. Thanks be to God that we know that we don't have all the answers, that we don't have it all together. Because Jesus is saying to us, I want you to be at work 
among the people in the world who you do not yet know, the relationships you have not yet formed. I want your life to be enriched by somebody whose background is different from your own. I want you to be at the edge of a place where you might be a bit uncomfortable, where you may not know the language, you may not know the custom, the food may seem a little odd to you, but get over it. I want you to engage it. I want you to receive the gifts that this world has to give to you day by day by day. Francis Asbury, the first bishop of the church in America, along with Thomas Koch, used to tell the Methodist, Methodist, he said, I want you to take the resources from the center to the circumference. He actually used the word circumference, the edge. I want you to take the resources from the center to the edge. Now, as we gather here, y'all, we got to confess, we're people at the center. We're members of the annual conference. Nobody's a delegate here. We're members. We're lay and clergy members of the annual conference and we are at the center of our congregations laity or we would not be here as a lay member we've been elected as lay members because people recognize our leadership our capacity our knowledge of the scripture we're people who by definition are at the center clergy also are here at the center we spend a lot of time with Methodists don't we all of us all of us do in this text, Jesus is saying to us, go and learn as you watch me. Go and learn what this means. I want you to be confident people who embrace those who you have not yet embraced. Watch. Watch what I'm doing. Go and learn what this means. Now, this is a continual journey, my friends. In our congregation, on the very back row, a young couple came every Sunday, sat with their two little children. They had not yet joined our church. They were faithfully there on the back row. And one Sunday they came forward and they said uh, to me and to some of the leaders who were congregated at the, at the front of the sanctuary after worship, we saw something on the internet last night that we really want this church to do. And I looked at them and said, well, what would that be? And they said, we saw the children of Chernobyl on the internet and we researched it and we believe, we know that this congregation would want to do that this summer. My response was, I don't think so. I don't think so. And there was a chorus around me of, we don't think so. And we probably had our arms crossed. I crossed my arms when I said it. That didn't feel too good. But that was the tenor of that conversation. I'll tell you a little more about that moment. It was in April, our family and I were moving from that congregation uh, at moving day come June. And I had thought, being in the center of that congregation for quite a while, that I needed to plan some good missional engagement and interaction so that the congregation would be moving forward because it would be a struggle for them to move forward without me. tape was playing somewhere. They insisted, oh, it's going to be great, they said. Get that, it's going to be great. We said, well, we don't think so. We already have work teams. We have all kinds of stuff planned. This, this would be over the top, too much. We're up to capacity. We're up to capacity. <laughs> and then Mike Schaefer said, let Laurie and I just share it with the congregation. Just let us share it. If nobody wants to do it. We'll do like you say, and we'll bring it up with a new pastor for next year. So the next Sunday, I invited them up. They said simply, friends, we have an opportunity. There are children living in Russia who are breathing this air that makes them sick. If we can bring them out for six weeks, we extend their life expectancy. All we need are 10 families, each of whom will take in a child for the summer. All we need is a doctor and a dentist to examine them and give them care while they're here. All we need is $500 each to supplement the airfare that someone else has already raised. If, if you feel like you'd like to do this, meet us in the foyer after church. By the time I made it to the foyer, 
They had recruited seven families, raised $3,000, had a doctor and a dentist, and we were gone. I mean, we were all on the way, all on the way. And our children's director is standing beside me, first having done the cross arms, we don't think so, we're maxed out, said, you know, I'm rethinking this thing, and I think we'll take one of the children also. <laughs> we moved from that congregation on Tuesday. New pastor moved in on Thursday, and the first thing that he did was to go to the airport and greet 10 children from Chernobyl with 10 families who were taking them home for the summer. A few weeks later, in August, I was in a grocery store in, in Raleigh, and I saw a friend from that church. She was in the cereal aisle, and she saw me, and we ran to each other and hugged, and I said, oh, it's been it's good, so good to see you. She said, it's good to see you. She said, I've got to tell you about this children from Chernobyl thing. She said, it's the best thing we have ever done. The best thing we've ever done. And she said, you know what else, Hope? We are having so much fun with the children from Chernobyl that we don't care who our preacher is. When we, my friends, are engaged at the edges, uh, we who lead the church just disappear, just step back into God's grace and give thanks to God for the marvelous working of the church at the edge. Matthew in his tax booth hears the word from Jesus. Come on, follow me. And Matthew comes down and, and follows Jesus. They recline at table, lots of tax collectors, lots of sinners, lots of people like that. And the Pharisees say, what in the world is your teacher doing hanging out with them? What is that all about? And Jesus says, I haven't come for the sick. I haven't come for the well. I've come for the sick. I haven't come for the righteous. I've come for the sinners. And today, my friends, this short little phrase... This short little phrase, I pray, will be written upon all our hearts. Let us go and learn what that means. Come sinners, come sinners to the gospel feast, so teaching him a Methodist. If O oh, for a thousand tongues is number one, come sinners to the gospel feast is number two. Charles Wesley wrote lots of verses. It's the only hymn in the hymnal that appears twice. It appears in the communion section, and it appears in the invitation section. It's a theme of Methodist people from the earliest times. We, my friends, are the first denomination in all Christendom to put into our communion liturgy, he ate with sinners. Those words, he ate with sinners. That's who Methodists are. This is what we do. Thanks be to God.